Now is it on? Can you hear me now? Are we good? Huh? Hello? Hello? All right. All right. Glad we got this equipment working now. And uh, praise the Lord. Uh, anyway, we want to go ahead and get in our song service for tonight. And uh, glad that you're able to tune in. And then uh, we'll read our missionary letter and then we'll get into the message for tonight. I want to sing Come Now Fount of Every Blessing, hymn number 169 in our hymn book. Come Now Fount. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing to my heart to sing Thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come. And I know by thy good pleasure, safely I'll arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it, Seal it for thy courts above. Amen. I want to read a prayer letter to, tonight by uh, the Holmes, our missionaries in Australia, and uh, what's going on in their lives down there. And uh, you remember we've been praying a long time that the Lord would send rain and, and uh, help Bernie as he's down there preaching and uh, pray that God would support that ministry as he labors down there in Australia. He says, Dear co-laborers and praying friends and faithful supporters, thank you all for thinking about us and praying for us since our last letter. You no doubt have all heard about the bushfires in Australia, how they've been burning for around five months or so uh, since August, and some folks have written us about them. And thank you so much for your concern. Thankful we did not have fires in our region this year, but we had them in our area last year. We're down laboring in those areas last year that were ravaged by the big drought, and at that time, by some large bu bushfires, Stanthrop, Tent Tenterfield, Glen Inns. But as we were uh, returning back to our own region, it was then that the bushfires really got started, and that you'd seen in New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, and Western Australia. And they've been raging, as previously mentioned, for about five months or. Uh, in five or six states. Thousands of firefighters fought these blazes for weeks on end, even months. And it's, so, it's only God's people praying for God to send rain, to put out the fires, provide water for the towns, cities, and farmers who need it. Thank you for praying. So much rain was sent that it put out the bush fires all over the country. And praise the Lord for that. Uh, a, a great answer to prayer. We know only our God could do that. Uh, so he says, thank you for praying, and uh, they push fires. We pray that God would mock the weather people who had said that our country would not see rain until April or May. And so he sent the rain, uh, mocked this crowd, and they said that they didn't know where the rain had come from because they said that it was not supposed to rain. But you and I know that God answered prayer. And so, uh, our two water tanks at home also are now full. No town or city water were there or we, where we are, so praise the Lord. I did not go north for a month, and so helping a couple of missionaries in a couple of different regions in the far north, and uh, they asked me to come and help out, and it was a good opportunity to get out with some of the young people, young men and women, uh, conducting outdoor evangelism, witnessing and giving out tracts. We were at uh, Melanda Markets in 
uh, younger bird markets. And what a great time it was encouraging uh, these young folks uh, in this type of outreach. Uh, it says now some of these young people, men, and will be headed for the ministry, we pray, as missionaries, pastors, evangelists, the young ladies as their wives. Some of them will be strong, steadfast, staying by the stuff at our home and church. Uh, so please pray for God's leading and direction for these, especially for their training and preparation. It was from this time, uh, uh, from this type of stock, Brother David Onus came pastor of the work at, in McKay. Some young men right now are looking uh, to older missionaries to train them in their own localities, and that's a big task, for the land is such a vast land, and the tyranny of distance makes it more difficult, and truly the labors are so few. Uh, so we would ask you to pray for us and for other missionaries as we're trying to meet that need. Some of us, the missionaries, are eight hours apart from each other. Some are even farther away from each other. And it's certainly becoming more of a mobile ministry for us as missionaries to accomplish this task. And more so now that we are seeing some missionaries and pastors drifting old-fashioned fundamental doctrines and practices of the past. We don't want the next generation of young pastors falling into doctrinal error and compromise, which seem to be so uh, intensifying. Uh, so continue to pray for them, for their ministry, for the radio ministry, for their uh, different ministries that they're involved in, and through their travels. Uh, continue to pray for the witness to go forth and uh, for the financial needs as well. And uh, so thankful for them and for the work that they have. And uh, what a privilege it is to be a part of that, to pray and uh, uh, provide financially and, uh, you know, the Lord's in it. And so I, I thank them for that. Um, for tonight, we're going to, this is the, the week where we're coming together, and we know that this is what is technically called uh, the Passion Week. Well, we know from this past week, Palm Sunday, the Lord came in, made his triumphal entry, weeps over Jerusalem, and he's coming, he's preparing for the cross. And as I think about the messages that I'm going to preach tonight, and for this weekend, I want to think about the power of God uh, because this is some trying times, is it not? And so I want to challenge your hearts tonight with the power of God. Um, on Tonight, we're going to talk about the power of God in supplication. Uh, on Sunday, we're going to talk about the power of God in salvation, the power of God in transformation, and the power of God in resurrection. And so I hope it will be a, a help and an encouragement to you as we get into that. And uh, so tonight I want to talk about the prayer of God in supplication or in prayer. And I want to take this drink of water real quick. The power of God in supplication and the Word of God tonight. I want to read a few passages and then we're going to get into the Word of God. We want to pray and then we're going to complete our study. And uh, so I want to lead you first of all to Ephesians chapter 6. Verses 16 through 20, we often talk a lot about the power of God in prayer. And true, I know that, uh, that, that our prayers are powerful. We see God answering prayers every day. Uh, even recently, Miss Ola, who went into the, the hospital, we were praying for her to get through that surgery. She's doing so well, and praise the Lord for that. But Ephesians 6, 16 through 20, we know that it's spiritual warfare. And so our prayer life and spiritual warfare, it says, above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. You see the connection there between the sword of the Spirit being the Word of God and then the supplication and prayer in the Spirit of God. But then he says, in watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I might open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. The Apostle Paul asking prayer himself there in those passages, praying for boldness to go out and proclaim the word of God, even though that he's bound by chains. And uh, anyway, I'll not go into all that right now. Luke chapter 2, verses 37, talking about the service and prayer talking about Anna the prophetess, and uh, it says, And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, 84 years old, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers 
night and day. And so there's her service, there's the strength, and then we go into the source of which we looked at this past Sunday. John chapter 15, verse 7, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. And the Lord hears and answers prayer. If we pray in Jesus' name, uh, He hears and answers these prayers. If you're a child of God, He delights in doing so. And so praise the Lord for that. Let's go to the word of, uh, to the Lord in prayer as we get into the message for tonight. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you that the word of God is still being preached and the power of God through salvation. Lord, we ask you that your word would go forth and be proclaimed that some would get saved. Lord, we pray as you do that all people would be saved. But Lord, we know some would refuse. We ask you, Lord, to guide and direct the message for tonight. Lord, that this would be a source of comfort, help, and encouragement. Lord, that we can see that we truly do have power and power in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you um, that you enabled us to still have come together to fellowship around the Word of God. And I pray you give power. Lord, I pray you meet the needs at home and abroad. Lord, whoever's listening in, I pray that this would specifically meet the needs that they're dealing with within their hearts. Lord, we love you. We thank you for our families. We thank you for our church family. We thank you for the grace of God who enables us uh, to still come together and to serve and to worship you. We give you all the glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, the common word for power in the Greek, you know it, is the word the way we get our English equivalent, uh, dynamite. Now dynamite, anybody who's ever been around dynamite or ever felt its power, you understand the, this, the impact that it has. Whether you've ever taken a stick of dynamite and you've thrown it uh, and you've seen it demolish houses or maybe to, to, to blow a hole in the ground to build, of a, to build a well. You understand the power of dynamite. It has incredible power and an incredible strength. And uh, it, when we think of the power here, the dunamis, the power that we find within the Word of God, that dynamite, we think of that power, we think of that force, we think of that ability that only comes from God. Uh, in the Bible, it mentions in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of what? Of power and of love and of a sound mind. That word power again, dunamis, that we find within Scripture. That dynamite power, that faith to stand against all opposition, to continue to go on. The Apostle Paul telling young Timothy to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And he sets him up to do the ministry. And the only way that he could do that is through the power of God. Uh, to stand against adversity, to serve in God's might, and uh, to, to do what he's called them to do. Sometimes it can refer to the miraculous power of God. We find over in Mark chapter 5, there's a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years. And then she spent all of her money on the physicians and so forth. And, and to no avail, it was no good. She determined within herself, she says, I want to go and to touch, but if I may touch but to him of Jesus' garment, I shall be healed. And that was her faith. And she snuck past all the crowd and touched the hem of his garment. And it says that Jesus realized that virtue had proceeded out from him or that power had been lost. It says this, it says, And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out from him. That word virtue is the same word as translated power. Uh, in the Greek text. Even in the next chapter, Mark chapter 6, we realize the power of God. For it says that uh, it, when he was going into Nazareth and some of his own countrymen, it says that a prophet is without honor in his own country. And it says there he could do no, no uh, marvelous, no great, uh, no mighty work there in Nazareth. He's able to heal maybe a few, but he was not able to do any mighty work in Nazareth. Luke chapter 4, verse 36 records Jesus' power to cast out unclean spirits with power and with authority. Again, that same word, that dunamis, that dynamite. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, Romans 1, 20, speaks of God's boundless power over creation. And uh, we understand what great power that he has to only speak the world into existence. Jesus promised power by the Holy Spirit given to the disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Ephesians 3, 20 through 21, Colossians 1, 29. All of this speaks of God's power displayed through the life of the believer as they yield and submit and trust God through the work and through the labor that he's given them to do. And so we understand then that it's power, the force, or the strength, all of it comes from God. He gives the ability, he gives the power, 
and is not of our own selves. Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, Jesus rebuking the Pharisees said, uh, But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. And so it's not by your own power, it's not by your own might, not by your own strength, but by the Spirit of the living God. When we speak about power of prayer, we're speaking about the petitioning of heavenly aid, resources, wisdom for our earthly needs, and it's recorded at, uh, it's according to God's will and for His glory. We can do a lot with, a, with the top medical professions, uh, those who practice medicine, the, the medical equipment that we have. There's a lot that we can do, but even they'll confess to you there's a lot that they can't do. But we know the one who's the great physician, the healer, the one who made our bodies, the framer, the fashioner, the physician uh, who can bring healing that others cannot do. And so we trust in him for our health and strength. He even holds our lives in his hands. And so uh, we understand that. So our first, uh, our first call and uh, prayer, our first call and prayer ought to be to God. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, every bit of it, shall be added unto you. And uh, because of that, it's able to change our, our physical circumstances and maladies that we're going through. We can trust Him in our lives. You understand that the, uh, accessing the power of God through prayer is our greatest responsibility, right? He invites. Uh, he even commands us to do so. He says men ought always to pray. And because he delights to show himself strong on behalf of those who love him. And that's what the Bible says. And so I want you to see tonight three great examples of prayer as spoken by our Lord. And uh, these are the last three prayers that our Lord has ever spoken before he goes to the cross. In fact, two of them are before he gets to the cross. That high priestly prayer, that prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then that last prayer, that prayer from the cross there on Calvary's Hill, Golgotha. And I want to challenge you with these thoughts uh, tonight. So today, and during this time especially, our Lord can relate to us. Uh, can, he has concern. Uh, concern cries out for God's compassion. Difficulty uh, embraces God's strength and ability. And weakness cries out for God's love. Concern cries out for God's compassion. Difficulty embraces God's strength and ability. And weakness cries out for God's love. And so we must pray uh, as our Lord prays, and what a challenge that it is to our heart. And uh, so first of all, we're going to be in John chapter 17 tonight. The glory prayer, as I've entitled it, to seek God's glory is our number one goal and what we ought to be praying for, for God to be magnified in our body. And so this is not meant to be an expositional message for tonight, and so I'm going to just draw out some highlights as we look at John chapter 17 and in fact, I'm only going to look at the first 11 verses. It says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven. And he said, Father, the hours come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only God, true God, and Jesus Christ. You know, he refers to himself and the third person, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou hast gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. And now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are are of thee for I have given them given unto them the words which thou gavest me and they have received them and have known surely that I come out from thee and they have believed that thou didst send me I pray for them I pray not for the world but for them which thou hast given me for they are thine and all mine are thine and thine are mine and I am glorified in them and now I am no more in the world but these are in the world and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. And so those first 11 verses of John 17, the number one theme, and you can see it mentioned five times there within Scripture, the number one theme that we find here in John chapter 17, and I think this throughout all of 17, is the glory of God. That's what Jesus prayed for. 
the glory here. Jesus wanted to bring glory to God in fulfilling the purpose of which he was sent to do, which was to go to the cross and die for every one of our sins. Uh, glory is to uplift, is to honor, is to magnify. And uh, you want to know something, my son, he would honor me by submitting to my will and uh, doing what I ask for the good of everyone, right? You know, if he would only submit, if he would only obey, he shows honor unto me. It magnifies the fact that I'm trying to teach him good in his life. And so here, the, the, the son here, he's trying to magnify his father. Jesus mentions how he magnified God by being about his father's business. The world seems to be vastly changing. Everyone, uh, you'll hear them tell you that they've never seen anything, not one time in their whole life, Some, several other people that I've talked to, Never seen anything like this in the whole wide world. They've never experienced a time where everything seemed to come to a halt, where there's so much death, so much sickness, so much uh, of this virus going around. Some people ask, is this God's judgment on the world for their sin, for their wickedness? And again, God judges sin, but uh, you know, they, this is their one question that they ask. Is this God's judgment on the world? Some people are wondering if this is a signal of the last days, the last times. And 1 John 2.18 says, Little children, it's the last time. And as you've heard that the Antichrist shall come, even now are there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So whether the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back today, tomorrow, or many years from now, hey, nobody knows. I don't know when that time will be, and, uh, but we know that he will come back. That's the promise of the Father. I don't know when it'll be, but we can trust God at his word. One thing I do know is that we're called now more than ever to do what? To give God glory in our lives. Give God glory due unto his name. The way that we think, the way that we act, the way that we treat others, the love that we show to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, that we show to our families, that we show to a lost and dying world, hey, we're to bring glory unto the name of Jesus Christ, glory unto the name of God, and, and that's what we're called to do during this time. I want to ask you a question. Can you say if you knew that your departure was soon at hand, can you say without a shadow of a doubt, as the Apostle Paul has said, there in the book of 2 Timothy, he says this, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith, and henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, should give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Can you say that? Can you say that you've glorified God with your life uh, as you try to live for him, as you try to serve him, as you've given your life, everything about the life of the Apostle Paul from the day that, that he, he had met the Lord on the road to Damascus, blinded by that light. And ever since then, his life was completely changed and wholly sold out to, to fulfilling that course in his life for God uh, that he wanted to do, to give God glory for how he changed him. He says, I am what I am by the grace of God. The shameful trial, I'm talking about the Lord Jesus Christ now. The shameful trial, the scourging, the mocking, the pain, the cross, all this is before Jesus. And he understands what's going to happen as it's been predicted within Scripture. He's not uh, foreign to it. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what's supposed to be fulfilled within the Scriptures. He's not shrinking from it. He's not cowering back. He's not holding back, but he's cool. He's calm. He's collective. And all that he desires to do is to do what? To glorify God, his Father. It's a choice. It's a choice. But let me just say to you this, that in his humanity, to suffer in all points like we are, is still a hard thing to go through, is it not? It's not easy. It's, it's a hard task, a difficulty. It's a trying time, just like the trying times that you and I are in now. And let me just ask you, what do you think that it would take to go through what Jesus went through? You say, uh, it'd take the power of God. Well, exactly, that's what I'm getting at. It would take the power of God, suffering the Father's wrath against sin, judging sin in his flesh of the only begotten Son, where he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So Jesus prayed for the Son to be glorified as the same glory of the gospel message is declared to be the power of God unto salvation, right? 
uh, to everyone that believeth. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. Romans 1, 4, uh, he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And so how are we to glorify God? How are we to glorify God? And Jesus told Simon Peter, he said, Satan, I desire to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you, and that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And can you imagine the strength that uh, Peter needed during this time, that he needed in order to glorify God, that he needed in order to strengthen his brethren. He didn't know what was going to happen. His whole world had uh, fell apart. We usually focus, uh, we could be like Peter, and sometimes we could focus on our failures, right? We get focused on our failures. We get focused on our disappointments. We get focused on our circumstances, our inability. But what did Jesus focus on? Focused on God's glory. Uh, Peter, follow me. Peter, feed my sheep. You see, we're to be salt in an unsavory world. We're to be light in a dark world. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that people may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. The light's the glory given by Christ to those who know Him as Savior. John chapter 17, the chapter that we're in now. Verses 22 through 23, you'll see it where it says, And the glory which thou gavest me, Jesus praying to the Father, the glory which thou gavest me, I've given who? To them that they may be one as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And so not only does it come from knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior, accepting his finished work on the cross and saying, I know he died in my place, I'm accepting uh, what he's done, dying on the cross for every one of my sins and believing by faith and accepting that substitutionary sacrifice on my account, not only is it knowing Christ as Savior, but it's also abiding in Christ as well as we've seen this past Sunday. Uh, you have a choice. You have a choice in how you're going to react to life's ebbs and flows. It's not always easy to make the right decision. It's not always easy to think the right thoughts all the time. It's not always easy to act in the right manner or act in the right way. But you have a choice that you can make. You have a choice in the attitudes and actions that you, you're going to take. And God's will isn't always easy, is it? It wasn't easy for Jesus to go to the cross. But you can be as the Apostle Paul confessed in Philippians 1.20, where he says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ, and get this, shall be magnified in my body whether it be by life or by death. Whether it be by life or by death, it wasn't an easy decision for the Apostle Paul, but he says, I'm going to make the decision. I'm going to glorify God in my body. I want to magnify Christ, whether it's by life or whether it's by the hard choice, by going, and, and, and we know this, what happens to the Apostle Paul. He, he goes there and he loses his head. He's martyred for the cause of Christ, but he was willing to do it, even though everyone in every city was telling them, don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go, Paul. You're, you know what's going to happen. You're going to be bound. You're going to lose your life. And he says, I'm willing for the cause of Christ. Is that, your, is that your goal, to glorify the Father? So let us learn to pray as our Lord prayed for God's glory in our lives. And let us not only pray for it, because it's one thing to pray for, it, right? Let us not only pray for it, but act on it through the help of of the Holy Spirit that indwells every single believer, every single one of us. And so let's, let's ask the Lord's help, the Holy Spirit that indwells us. Let's act on it. Not only pray for it, but act on it through the help of the Holy Spirit that indwells us. And then we move on to Matthew chapter 26. We pray for God's glory. Lord, give me the power to glorify you uh, as, as Jesus Christ was glorified just through doing it, the will of the Father, okay? And so Matthew chapter 26 tonight. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 is where I'm heading. Verse 
36, Matthew chapter 26, verse 36, it says this. Uh, it says, Then cometh Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane. We know about that place. That's where Jesus often resorted to pray. And he saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John. We know who they are. And he began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And then said, saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful. Even unto death, tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further, and he fell on his face, and he prayed, saying, O, o my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep. And he saith unto Peter, What could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not in temptation. The spirit indeed is willing. Get that. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is what? Weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and he found him asleep again, but their eyes were heavy. And he left him and he went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. And then covered thee to his disciples and said unto him, Sleep on now. Take your rest, behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed, and the hands of sinners rise, and let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. And so we find the second of all, the Christ's prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, to pray not only to glorify the Father in John 17, but the prayer to submit to God's will, not an easy thing to do. And I want you to see three things about this prayer. The Lord's Prayer, of course, uh, what Jesus tells his disciples, and then uh, something that we find in Luke's account that we don't really see here uh, in this scripture, but Luke chapter 22, verse 43, we'll get there. Sometime after what is known as the high priestly prayer in John 17 is the prayer that we find here. We don't know how much time transpired between uh, John 17 and Matthew 26. We don't know how long that it took in between that time period, but we understand that there's more of an intensity. There's more of a sorrowfulness, more of a troubling, uh, more of a sorrow that's here, as in John chapter 17. John 17, he seemed to be more cool, calm, collective. Here, it's marked by the words we see it in verse 38, where he said unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death tarry ye here, and watch with me. Jesus' is only prayer with him, watch, guard, Pray that you enter not into temptation. And Jesus is in the garden. He's there with Peter, James, and John. Leaves them on the outer edge. Only this one instruction. And then he tells, uh, goes a little farther out on his own. He's there alone. He's praying. Uh, and, and he says this. He says, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou, as thou wilt. This cup was a cup of judgment. Always seems to refer to that as we find it within Scripture. It was the cross. He prays for God's will to be done. It wasn't an easy prayer because he knew what God's will was. But the whole message, uh, messages, whole messages have been preached on this. And Jesus prays for God's will, his substitutionary sacrifice on the cross to be accomplished. But I don't think that we can fully grasp the meaning without the next part of which I want to emphasize uh, throughout all of this. Uh, I don't think we can understand what Jesus is getting at when he says, not my will, but thy will be done. We understand the next part that I really want to emphasize for just a moment, if you just bear with me. Uh, what does Jesus say to his disciples in verse 41? What does he say in verse 40, 41? He says, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Doesn't that sound like the Lord's struggle that's going on right now? It says, not the will of my flesh. Not the, not the will of this struggle that I'm going through, but Lord, thy will be done. Heavenly Father, thy will be done. And so we've been looking at Galatians chapter 5, and we'll continue on with the, uh, the messages on the fruit of the Spirit. But in Galatians chapter 5, we understand that there's a strong battle that's going on within every believer there's that struggle of the flesh that seems to be so natural and so real uh, that 
has a grasp or a hold over here and is fighting, is warring, is battling over here against the, the Spirit, isn't it? And we understand from Galatians chapter 5 that this battle is taking place inside every one of the believers, and we can choose who's going to win because of the choices we make, who we feed more. And so that's Galatians chapter 5, but we also understand the same struggle in Romans chapter 7, right? A struggle to the flesh and the spirit, a constant battle, a hard battle that everyone has to fight. I love the book of Romans, and I'm just about finished with it, my devotions, as a matter of fact. Uh, but in Romans chapter 8 is the highlight of the whole uh, book of Romans. Romans chapter 8 it begins to talk about those who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. We see that in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There's therefore now no condemnation to them uh, who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, right? Uh, so it begins to talk about those who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. But verse 9 begins to highlight something for us. He says, but you're not in the flesh, but where? In the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. You're not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit, and the spirit of God dwelleth in you. And that shows our position, and it continues on to say this. He says, now if any man have not the spirit of Christ... It goes on to clarify it. If you have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Then drop down to verses 13 to 14. It says, If you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. If you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you have that choice. If ye, if you, through the Spirit, through the power of the Holy Spirit, mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. You'll be led by the Spirit of God. If you through the Spirit, what did Jesus say? The Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He says that the flesh is weak in the sense that uh, not that it doesn't have power, not that it doesn't have pull, but it's weak in the fact that a lot of times we give in to the flesh, don't we? We give in to it. And, and, and a lot of times we just say, well, I'm, I'm just a sinner. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And, and we constantly give ourselves excuses, leniency. Uh, we, we, we give in to the flesh. The flesh is weak. But the Spirit is indeed willing. That's what Jesus said, right? The Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's what He tells us. We can be strong through the, the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is wanting and willing to give us the victory. Luke chapter 22, uh, verse 40. I want to turn it over there for just a moment. Luke chapter 22, verse 40. Jesus tells his disciples to pray. And pray. He tells them in Luke chapter 22, verse 40, he says, Pray that you enter not into temptation. Pray that you enter not into temptation. Matthew chapter 6, verse 13 says, uh, and of course that's the model prayer that we all know, but a part of that model prayer, he says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Bible tells us in James 4, resist the devil. It tells us in 2 Timothy 2, 22, flee also useful lust, but follow after righteousness faith, charity, peace, and with them that call on the name of the Lord have a pure heart. And what you find in contrast to our weakness and giving in to the flesh, and we find Christ's strength. We find that prevailing in the Spirit. So you see the picture there? He tells the disciples to pray. Pray that you enter not in temptation, and he comes back and he finds them asleep. He says the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he finds them asleep. They're not giving in to the Spirit. But Jesus, on the other hand, his flesh is weak. But who's he giving in to? He's giving in. He's choosing the Spirit, the power of God. And that's the picture that I'm trying to get to you. He's prevailing through the Spirit. And we need to pray for God's strength to submit to his will through the Spirit of God. Jesus prayed, not my will, but thine be done. It's a hard decision to make. I believe a lot of us want to 
God's will to be done, but we keep making allowances for the flesh. We need to mortify it. We need to crucify it. We need to turn away from it. We need to flee those youthful lusts. We need to resist the devil and draw nigh unto God. What happened when Jesus prayed in verse 43 of Luke chapter 22? He says there, And there appeared unto him an angel. There appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. There's no temptation taking you. No temptation taking you by such as common to man, right? But God will, with the temptation, make a way of escape. So you don't have to give in to the temptation of the flesh, and you can serve in the power of God's might. Uh, you can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth you. You can choose God's will in the midst of difficulties, and you can serve in the power of God's might. And don't just pray for God's will to be done. Again, just like I mentioned in in John chapter 17, there's, we can pray until we're blue in the face, but you need to do serious business and say, I'm going to be about my Father's business. I'm going to glorify God with the help of the Holy Spirit working in me. But just like that, in John chapter 17, we find it here in Matthew 26, and submitting to God's will, it's not only praying, Lord, thy will be done, but it's meaning business and saying, Lord, with your help, Lord, with your strength, Lord, I believe you'll give me the help through the Holy Spirit. I'm going to submit to the Spirit. I want to live in the Spirit. I want to walk in the Spirit. I want to mortify the deeds of the body. I believe God can help me accomplish His will. I want to deny the flesh, and I want to accomplish your will for God's glory. And so we see, um, first of all, Jesus praying for the glory of God to be fulfilled in His body. We see, second of all, uh, here... Jesus submitting to the will of the Father. That's a hard prayer to pray. But third of all, I want you to go last, just one chapter over from Luke chapter 22 to Luke chapter 23. We were to pray for God's glory to be shown in our lives. We're to pray for the power to resist temptation and submit to God's will. But finally, we're to pray for God's love to be shown in our lives. Luke chapter 23, verses 33 and 34, just two verses tonight. It says, and when, we, uh, it says, and when they were come to the place, and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucify him, and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And here's the prayer. And then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Have you ever been done wrong by somebody? I believe all of us at some point in our lives have suffered wrongdoing from the hands of somebody else. And, and you know, we, we're hoping they get what they have coming to them, right? I confess to you that the, the prayer that Jesus prays here is not an easy prayer to pray. For us to show God's love to a lost and dying world, to those who do you wrong, it's a hard prayer thing to comprehend but aren't you glad that jesus prayed this prayer for you and for me i'm glad when it comes to the cross of calvary i know that i've done many things as the apostle paul would say in the book of acts i've i've done a lot of things that i thought contrary to the name of christ until paul came face to face with the lord uh, high and lifted up there on the road to damascus we've done many things contrary to the name of of Christ, and, and in fact, that's the reason why he had to go to the cross and die for every one of our sins, because we are sinners, we're all hell-deserving sinners, and, and without his help and without his power and without his strength, we would be doomed, right? We th- oftentimes think that it's contrary to our, our thoughts, our minds, our imaginations. How could you, against people who are mocking you, ridiculing, puck, plucking your beard out, scourging you, beating you, tormenting you, thinking this is, uh, you're doing God a favor by hanging Jesus Christ upon a cross. And how could he say from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Maybe they, at one point, many people don't know uh, that, that what they're doing, that the just condemnation, we'll just give them the benefit of the doubt, all right? Uh, It's true that many might be ignorant of the consequences of their actions. Many are 
ignorant of God's love and taking their sins and their griefs and burying them upon his own body upon the tree. They're at Calvary. There are many things that you and I and uh, those present at the time here in the Bible might have been ignorant of. But after hearing those words of Jesus, there as he cries out, as he's a bloody mess, as he's beyond recognition of those who just tormented him, there's no doubt that they can deny after hearing those words and seeing it and understanding, hey, I put him up, he's dying for me, and to hear those words, uh, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. There's no way possible in their farthest imagination that they can deny the love of God. They can't do it. As he dies there on the cross for their sins, for you, for me, for the sins of the whole world, that blood to make an atonement for their sins. This was the fulfillment of the scripture found in Isaiah 53, verses 11 through 12. It says, He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And get this, he bare the sin of many and made intercession for who? He made intercession for the transgressors. It's a fulfillment of the scriptures. He made intercession for the transgressors. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? We can get offended by many things, can't we? Why don't you turn that offense into a way to show God's love to somebody? Instead of getting upset, instead of wearing your feelings out on a sleeve, why don't you turn those things of offense and turn it into a way to show God's love to a lost and dying world? Because that's what we're called to do. And we say, Father, forgive them for they know that. That's the prayer that Stephen prayed. As he's being stoned to death, as he preached a wonderful message to the Jewish people, I believe that he, as the Apostle Paul, wished that all Israel might be saved. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Use it as an opportunity to show God's love. Lord, help me to show God's love to somebody today. You say they don't deserve it. Well, did you deserve it? Did you deserve God's love? When you think about it in the same way that you pass that judgment upon somebody else. Because I think that you're thankful that Jesus Christ prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Romans chapter 12, verses 19 through 21. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. In so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. So pray for opportunity to show God's love during this time. Pray for uh, time to glorify God. Pray to submit to God's will. Lord, help me, because my flesh is weak. Our biggest failures many times are due to prayer, right? As we see that Jesus Christ prayed and oftentimes went to his father and he prayed for his help. And, and, and we see it a lot as revealed under scripture during this time as he's facing difficulty and hardships. He prayed for God's strength, prayed for God's ability, prayed for God's glory, prayed for God's will, prayed for God's love. Our biggest failures we find many times are due to prayer. We pray... Uh, we find within Scripture the prayer of faith will save you. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Are they sick? Let them call for the elders of the church and let them pray. Pray that I might have boldness, the Apostle Paul prayed. But many times this is the condemnation. In James, we have not because we ask not. We have not because we ask not. Let us pray as Jesus prayed to glorify God in our bodies. Let us pray as Jesus prayed. 
Lord, your will be done. Let us pray as Jesus prayed. Help me to show the love of God to the lost and dying world. We have not because we ask not. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for your grace. Lord, again, we lift up the, the Walters family as uh, this funeral, Lord, uh, this fellow that Ken worked with for, for five years. And, Lord, we do pray for the salvation, for the gospel message to be preached, proclaimed, and, Lord, that many would be saved on account of this. Lord, we don't know how it's going to fall out. We never do. But, Lord, only you know the work that you accomplished through your word and through your will. Lord, we ask you to be with uh, our missionaries. Again, we, we thank you for the answer prayer there for the Bernie Hong and for the mission field out in Australia, how you sent rain against those who, who, who claim to be professionals uh, of uh, the weather. You know, they can think they can predict everything, and it wasn't supposed to come until... May, but Lord, we see that you answer prayer in the face of the experts. And Lord, we thank you that you're able to get glory through that. And Lord, we thank you that you're able to get glory through all of our other missionaries as they continue to serve, as they continue to be faithful. And Lord, as they continue to proclaim your word and to serve in the power of your might and your will. Lord, to show the love of God to a lost and dying world. We pray for the finances, Lord, that uh, they may need. We, Lord, we pray for their health, that you would protect them against viruses. Lord, we pray for their provision through whatever that may be, Bible colleges, whether it be the, through sending laborers into the mission field. Lord, you know exactly what that is. Lord, we lift up Miss Ola. We pray for her strength. Uh, Lord, for a quick and speedy recovery. Lord, he would help her. And we pray for Mr. Swain as he's at home and and, Lord, we pray for him as well. Lord, what a witness that he is to us. And, Lord, we praise you for him and for his testimony and for his love for this church. And Lord, we lift up uh, the many who are working in the hospitals. And, Lord, we pray for them, for their strength and for their patience and for their uh, perseverance during this tough time. And, Lord, we pray that you would just give them a peace of mind and a calmness of spirit, Lord, again, to, to show your love. And, Lord, we pray for those... Uh, who are working in a nursing home. And Lord, we pray for those who may be out and about and still uh, working in their various jobs, wherever they may be. Lord, I know some of them have been affected by this, and some have even lost jobs. And Lord, I think of the one in particular who has lost his job, and, and Lord, I pray for him that you provide for him financially. And, Lord, that you would meet his needs. Lord, I thank you for the ministry that still goes on here, for the many who are still coming and still working and still cutting the grass and still uh, serving in the various different aspects. Lord, I'm glad that I don't have to do this alone. I thank you for the many prayer warriors in our church who lift up my hands. Lord, I pray for those who are going through illnesses and uh, physical maladies during this time. Lord, we pray for those who are dealing with uh, various cancers and those who are um, going through treatments and so forth. Lord, I pray you be with them and strengthen them. Lord, I pray for your provision, for your protection. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. Lord, we do uh, lift up the salvations on our prayer sheet. Uh, many we've been praying for for a very long time. Lord, we lift them up. Uh, to you, Lord, you know who they are. We pray for them every single day. And, Lord, I wouldn't embarrass them for the world, but we do lift them up. In um, particular, look at Nick, honestly. I pray for him all the time. Lord, uh, I do pray for the various pastors and ministries who are proclaiming your word, Lord, that you would just uh, be with those ministries and help them to persevere, protect them. Lord, I pray you be with the pastors. Lord, I pray you be with the evangelists who, who are needing work. I pray you be with the missionaries who are uh, trying to get to the mission fields. Uh, Lord, those on deputation, Lord, you provide for them. Lord, thank you for what you've called us to do, and pray you give us the wisdom and the strength to do it. Lord, we, we love you. Lord, we wouldn't be here without you. Lord, we wouldn't have a ministry without you, a gospel to proclaim. I pray you be with us uh, this coming weekend as we give your word clearly. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.